Welcome in. There we go. That's my version of Steve's opening. Steve, as you can see, is not in the chair because he's in Boston, but he is on the phone, on the headset. How's it going, Steve? How was Christmas? It was fantastic. You could work on that opening, though. I, I just... Welcome I, in. That's, an, that's how you did it, right? That's that's your shtick? Yeah, yeah but you got to you know, maybe do your own thing. You need your own opening just in case. Oh, okay. You want? I need my own one. I haven't been. Yeah. I haven't been planning one myself. <laughs> you need to work on that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Fair enough. Christmas was great. I'm back in uh, Boston, where I'm initially from, and I forgot how easy it is to commute when you don't have to go to an office. I yeah. Showered and just rolled into a room to record the podcast. Right. Great. From your bedroom to a different room. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So uh, yeah, just ready to go. We got a hard out today because Disney on Ice is waiting. Disney on Ice, yep, yeah. hard out for Disney on Ice. So you and I were talking before this show. Um, we're not going to go through like every single game and give you, you know, exhaustive predictions on games that honestly even the teams themselves don't care about. Um, right. But we are going to run through the playoff scenarios and then touch on every single game at least somehow. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Let's, do, let's go through all the important stuff and, and give everybody at least a little something to leave the Week 17 preview with. All right, so where do you want to start? All right, let's start with the, the AFC, and we'll just go through the top. You know, NFL.com does a nice job laying out a lot of the playoff scenarios, so we'll go through the games that have some kind of implications. So starting with, you know, the Baltimore Ravens are already clinched. We'll get to them in a second. But the number two seed is up for grabs. The New England Patriots hosting the Miami Dolphins. That'll be the first game we touch on because if New England wins, they clinch the all-important first round by against the 4-11 and 11 Dolphins. Yes. So is it, is any it, chance for the Fitzmagic to work here? That's what I was going to ask. Am I crazy to think that like, this is not in the bag? Yeah, it was. It's one of those, remember back in week two, we said, look, if you know, anytime New England goes to Miami, weird stuff happens. And, you know, if they did put Fitzmagic in at the time, which I don't think he started that game, or maybe he did. But, you know, anything could happen when he um, is out there for, for real. But um, I'm not expecting this to be uh, one of those games. He's His YOLO balls don't always work against uh, New England's pretty good coverage. And I don't know if New England can, you know, kind of build on what they did last week as far as their offense against Buffalo. But I still feel a little bit better about them putting up some points against the Dolphins at home and New England's treating this like a playoff game it's not just another game against the Dolphins so I think I'm not expecting the Fitz magic yeah I mean I think that's the critical part of this is that you know he's going to go out we know what we're getting from Ryan Fitzpatrick in terms of every single week he's going to go out there throw the YOLO balls but that doesn't just give receivers a chance to make plays that gives defensive backs a chance to make plays and the Patriots have some pretty good defensive backs yeah, they do, and I think that leads you know to some pretty good matchups. You have Devontae Parker, who has really emerged this year uh, a little bit more than he has in previous years. Signed the long-term extension. You know, will he see a little bit of Stephon Gilmore down the field? Uh, the Pats have been banged up on the back end. Jason McCourty a little hurt. Jonathan Jones, their slot corner, has been banged up. So that could be a bit of an issue. But I think those those downfield matchups will be important. And New England is as difficult as it gets as far as complete passes down the field. They have two of the top three cornerbacks in terms of pass rating allowed in the NFL this season. So J.C. Jackson is allowing an absurd 29.6 pass rating when targeted. And Stephon Gilmore is at 39.7. Um, plus, in addition to his six picks, he's also got 12 pass breakups. So, yeah, Fitzpatrick's going to put the ball in the air and it is not going to be easy for his receivers to come down with it as opposed to Patriots DBs. Yeah, that's, so I think the, that's one of those matchups to watch. I think on the other side, we talked a lot on the review podcast last week. Hey, New England did a lot. They, they had to work really hard to run an efficient offense against Buffalo, but they were working hard to create mismatches in the run game and, uh, you know, have a little bit of balance on offense and create a few uh, open throws off of play action in the pass game. Uh, they do need to continue, just continue that groove if they're going to carry it into the playoffs. Uh, they move the ball pretty, you know, back when they played him in week two, they moved the ball well against the Dolphins. They also had Antonio Brown back then, which feels like right. you know, years ago. Uh, 
but Miami, you know, even though they've shown signs of life on defense, they're still dealing with a whole bunch of guys that might not be a part of their long-term strategy on the, on the defensive side of the ball. So I'm expecting New England to be able to handle, take care of business, and, and earn that buy. I mean, I think it'll be an interesting uh, look at just how hard work it is for this Patriots offense to manufacture these plays. Like, they, lo- they were struggling and laboring to – production against the Bills, but the Bills have a really good defense. Miami does not have a really good defense. If it still looks like hard work, I think they have real problems. If, you know, if it, if it looks easy, if it looks like these are just plays that they're on top of all the stuff they have normally against the Dolphins, and it's it's not a hard uh, issue to, to move the ball and have offensive production, then I think, you know, it's a different conversation. But if it still looks like hard work and, and ugly uh, laboring offense against Miami, then like they've got some real problems going into the postseason, whether or not they wrap up in the the second seed. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, it's <laughs> New England doesn't have the best personnel, and they haven't played all that well the second half of the season offensively. And then you you pulled out the stat: the teams that play the most man coverage, right? It's New England. It's all the Patriots. Detroit. It's Detroit, Miami. Right? Yeah. Three. Yeah. So it's the whole Belichick coaching tree. So if you're looking for something schematically, it's man coverage versus man coverage. Uh, if New, you know, New England has generally struggled when teams try to man up against them because they just don't have the greatest playmakers to, to win one-on-one outside of Edelman. Um, so it's going to be, you know, I think they're going to run some Belichickian type of let's take Edelman out of the game, make Brady go elsewhere like other teams have done. So there's, you know, there's a path to success there for Miami because they've, they've got the type of scheme that can slow New England down. Is this the most pessimistic outlook that a 12-3 and three team has ever had rolling into the, the Week 17 and the postseason? Like the Patriots, everybody's talking, including us, that, you know, they're struggling, they've got real problems, this offense, it just looks like it's hard work. Ultimately, they're 12-3, and three and... You know, like they're a game ahead of Kansas City, who everybody's talking up for the Super Bowl. Now, it's not like for like. The Patriots, you know, schedule has been a cakewalk. Uh, Kansas City has been missing Mahomes for periods of the season. But, like, this is not all doom and gloom. They're still in pretty good shape. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pessimistic because the two teams that they will likely face in the playoffs, the Chiefs and the Ravens, they already lost to, uh, including the Chiefs at home. The Ravens, you know, pretty handily on Sunday Night Football. They would still have to go through Baltimore. And just because the expectations over the last 20 years that the Patriots, for, for whatever people want to say, it's not like Belichick has always rolled a great defense out there. I mean, they, especially since 2007, that's been an offensive-driven team that has also had some years where the defense has been really good. Right. We're seeing that regression offensively in New England, so it doesn't feel like the same team. So, yeah, it's a lot of pessimism compared to what you usually see from the Patriots. All right. I think we're both – you know, anticipating a fairly comfortable Patriots win, correct? Yeah, I would say so. All right. So then, so then the other the other game is, is the Chiefs. Now, the the NFL did a nice job of scheduling these so that teams can't look at what's happening elsewhere and then make adjustments. So at the same time, the Chiefs will be hosting the Los Angeles Chargers, and the Chiefs are hoping for another Miami miracle along with a win. And that would be the Chiefs' path to getting a bye. It is it is unlikely, but the Chiefs have to play this game to win. Uh, despite, I'm sure they would love to have a you know have their seed wrapped up, be able to rest Mahomes, get him ready for the playoffs. But the, you know, the Chiefs have to play this one out against the Chargers. They do, um, and the Chargers are fast becoming one of those teams where like who the hell knows what's going to show up in any given week. Um, for real, like this Philip Rivers thing is is not ending in a particularly auspicious manner you've got to think that the Chargers aren't particularly keen on bringing him back at this point because it doesn't look like 2020 and beyond outlook is particularly rosy yeah I mean it, what's the difference between Rivers and say Fitzpatrick at this point and may, not necessarily over the last two years let's not forget just how well Rivers played the first you know 13 14 weeks of the season last year but Rivers still has that ability. We keep saying, you know, he's he's going to chuck it up to the Mike Williams of the world and let them make plays. Hunter Henry and Keenan Allen, he still has these guys to throw to. And the Chargers might need to try to roll with him beyond this year because I don't know what their other options are. I mean, they're, they're going to look hard at the draft, I'm sure, but who knows where that, where that lands. But Rivers is going to be that intriguing guy that's going to give guys opportunities to make plays down the field. And that's why 
in any given week, you really don't know what's going to happen from the Chargers. You're going to get turnover worthy throw, Philip Rivers, or like, hey, remember, remember me? I've been a top ten quarterback for a big chunk of my career, Philip Rivers. Yeah, um, I, I think he's in a similar boat to Brady in terms of they've reached the point in their careers now where they need more help than they did in the past. Uh, I think Rivers has yeah. that from a receiver point of view, but they've never, ever stitched together an offensive line in front of him that gives him any kind of help. And he's reached the point now where he needs that. Like, the, gone are the days where Rivers can just make up for the fact that you've you've assembled five stooges in front of him and there's just a never-ending right. amount of pressure coming down on him. So, I, I mean, I think unless you're – unless you have a fix to that offensive line for 2020 and beyond i just don't think that it's worth bringing them back for what it would cost particularly like i think everybody is everybody has gone sour on tyrod taylor because of what happened in cleveland when he finally got you know we got him outside of the confines of buffalo he went to start somewhere else and it was just an unmitigated disaster start to finish um but the seasons before that, like Tyra Taylor is a, a very specific type of quarterback, but not a bad one. Like you can win games with Tyra Taylor. You don't necessarily need the best offensive line in the world in front of him. Um, you know, I, I think the Chargers, even just given an equal choice between those two guys in 2020, would be thinking about Tyrod. Yeah, I mean, we were sitting here a couple of years ago saying, look, I don't, I don't know that Tyrod's the long-term answer in Buffalo but he's a pretty good bridge. You know, I, we, he was, when we started this whole theory of, you know, keep looking, keep looking, I think Tyrod was in that. Is he the 15th best quarterback in the league? Is he the 18th or 20th? I think he was, he was in that range. Uh, but he, it opened up that, look, just keep looking. I don't, I think everybody, every fan base is like, is this our guy or is it not our guy? And it's okay to say this guy's a bridge quarterback. And I think that's where Tyrod is. Right. You know, he's the bridge until you find the next guy so yeah it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world i also don't think that's instilling a ton of excitement into the limited chargers fan base if they're rolling with tyrod next year no it's not but i I think if that's your selling point you're probably not going anywhere in the first place i mean (laughs) they played against the raiders and it was a true away game in their home stadium so yeah i'm not sure i'm sure there's a way of galvanizing a support base that basically doesn't exist um what about for the Chiefs? The, the inter- interesting thing for them is that their, their defense has done this year what we talked about them needing to do last year in terms of just being good enough to be able to steal some possessions here or there and rely on the fact that they have one of the best offenses in the NFL to score more points in the opposition. Yeah, I mean, so we talked about New England being a team. Are you a little more pessimistic because their offense, it, offense isn't as good? Now, Kansas City has clearly shown they can be explosive on offense, but they're coming into this off se- this uh, postseason with less hype than they did last year because last year it was one of those, you know, 07 Patriots, 13 Broncos, like these explosive 2016 Falcons, these incredible offenses that really weren't slowed down much uh, throughout the season. The Chiefs have been slowed down at times. They're still capable, but they are cleaner on the defensive side of the ball. We talked about last week how – you know, they could scheme it up a little bit. They've got those two safeties, Juan Thornhill, Tyron Matthew, just roaming the middle. They're using them extremely well. So I think it's, you know, Kansas City's as dangerous as they were last year, if not more dangerous, just because they can win uh, in different ways. And I think if if the good Chargers team shows up, this could be a nice matchup. You know, you still have Derwin on the other side, matching up with Travis Kelsey, and Rivers can – you know, challenge down the field, as we said. This should be a decent matchup, but I do love what Kansas City's done defensively just to kind of, you know, tighten the game up just a little bit and not have to play a 40 to 35 type of shootout every single week. Yeah, the, the Chiefs defense has done our favorite catchphrase. It has crept back towards average. If you look at yes. if you look at the defensive rankings, the ELO rankings on PFF Green Line um, for this game, Kansas City is 23rd, right? So it's not like they've become good, but they're no longer an unmitigated disaster that is going to be the reason you're losing playoff games. They are a below average defensive unit, which when you have an excellent offensive unit is good enough. Like they don't need to be good. They just need to be capable of buying you a couple of extra possessions, um, arena league style, so that your offense, you know, has a little bit of wiggle room. Yeah, and you know, the, last year in the matchups against the Chargers too, they did a nice job scheming up against what you know, a lot of what you see is what you get type of defense. Last year, the Chargers did win down the stretch. They did a, a much better job against Kansas City. 
Um, and then this, you know, Kansas City won, you know, in the first matchup. But um, again, I think division matchups they could be they could be tight. They could be pretty decent. So uh, twenty four to seventeen in the first matchup. That's what I'm saying with the Chiefs, right? They've had a lot more games where they've scored 24, 23, 26, and it's not right. that straight blowout every single week because they have crept back toward average on defense and they're playing, you know, some tighter games. Yeah, I mean, they've also been dealing with a banged up Mahomes for most of the year. Um, whether he was on the field or not, he hasn't been 100%. And the last couple of weeks have looked more like you know, actual Patrick Mahomes. So that, I think, has to be encouraging for them. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think going into the playoffs maybe with less hype, but you get a little bit, uh, you won't really get a break from with for Mahomes unless, you know, a couple things happen here. But um, more than capable offensively, I'm expecting the Chiefs to, to take care of business here. Um, not sure it'll matter as far as seeding, though. I think they'll be locked into the three seed. Um, so they'll be hosting a wild card game. And then more than likely, they win that. They will go to New England in round two. Okay, so we're both picking the Chiefs. Let's get to the comedy that is the fact that the Oakland Raiders can still make the playoffs. Yeah, do you want to read through the scenario? You want me to? Because this is... So the seven and eight Raiders still have a chance. The seven and eight Raiders can clinch a wild card spot with a win um, and a Pittsburgh loss and a Tennessee loss and and Indianapolis win. Um, but that way, the Raiders will clinch strength of victory tiebreaker over the Steelers. Um, it's it's pretty chaotic. The, their biggest problem, I think, comes with the fact that they need Pittsburgh to win against a, or Pittsburgh to lose, rather, against a Ravens team that's resting everybody because they clinched. Yeah, I think because uh, these next three games we're going to break down are going to be those, right? So Raiders, yeah. Broncos, Steelers, Ravens, and then Titans, and uh, Texans. Maybe we, maybe we should go in reverse order that I listed, just because Tennessee completely controls their controls their own destiny. The Steelers control their destiny a little bit less, and then yeah, okay. Raiders control their destiny least of all. All right, so let's talk. Yeah, Tennessee, Houston, because a this is quite interesting given they played each other a couple of weeks ago, given how that matchup went, and as you say, they actually control their own destiny. They just need to win. All right, so let's do that. So Titans at the Houston Texans. Titans win and they're in. And they've got Hall of Famer Ryan Tannehill Mm -hmm. leading the charge. That game a few weeks ago, it was just weird, right? I mean, there was just uh, quirky plays on both sides. Red uh, red zone and end zone interceptions for both quarterbacks. Uh, A Tannehill one that probably should have been a touchdown. Yeah, they, Carlos Hyde was kind of the catalyst for the Texans. Just an odd game all around. They went the the Titans went fourteen nothing down and should by rights have been seven nothing up based off the bounce of a ball. So now it was a good defensive play. You know, somebody came in and jarred the receiver, basically popped the ball up, interception taken back almost to the house. Um, so it's not like it was just a complete fluke lucky play. It was a good defensive play that prevented that being a touchdown and, and turned it into a pick. But nine times out of ten, that pass is caught. The tight end ends up barreling his way across the plane and we were talking about a touchdown here um, certainly wasn't an interception that you put on Ryan Tannehill but that yeah that game just went weird to start and then the the, t- the Titans almost dragged their way back to a win but couldn't get it done in the end yeah and the Titans are coming off a game against the Saints which was you know hey they were in control then they equally weird coverage. just in a different direction Right. I mean, they, they bust their own coverage, and it's a 67-yarder to Jared Cook. And before you know it, they're, uh, they're struggling to stop the pass. They've just been so beat up in the secondary. That, you know, Tremaine Brock starting last week and LaShawn Sims in that secondary, where normally they're trotting out guys like Malcolm Butler, who's out for the season, or Dory Jackson, who's been hurt. Uh, and, you know, they, they, they're trotting out this pretty good secondary that in any given week can match up. And I think, you know, trying to figure out who the Texans are, has been a struggle, but at their best, it's Nuke and a healthy Will Fuller. Even you know he's been he's had his own injury issues, but Duke Johnson out of the backfield, a couple tight ends to throw to, and it's this really difficult offense to defend. But we've only seen it a few times. But it's again another one of those teams. In any given week, you can see the Texans spreading the ball around and you know, creating efficient offense behind Deshaun Watson, who again at his best is one of the best in the league. 
I think everybody keeps waiting for the Ryan Tannehill, the wheels to fall off that wagon. What's kind of scary is that he's actually playing better recently. Like, he's got three out of the last five games have a PFF grade over 90. Uh, One of the two that doesn't is at 85. That was that previous Houston game. He's basically got one non-elite game in the last five. Like, the, the wheels are not just not falling off. The wagon is actually getting sturdier and more robust as the season goes. Yeah, the one complaint is the way he's taken sacks. You know, he took a bunch against the Saints the other day. But as far as throwing the football, he's been just outstanding. I mean, just in that game the other day, when they're down, and this is this is where Tannehill was lacking a lot with the Dolphins, right? It's like the game gets out of hand. You're down 10. You need to make a comeback. It's a must-pass situation. And Tannehill wasn't really the best situational football-wise, red zone or fourth quarter comebacks, whatever it is. When they needed him the other day, drops a, uh, drops a diamond to A.J. Brown down the field. He has that beautiful red zone touchdown where he scrambles out. It's a really tight window. He zips it in there. He'll pick up 10 with his legs on the ground when he needs to. And he actually dropped a beautiful pass into Corey Davis that could have been a spectacular big play. And Davis just couldn't call mm. it in inbound. So, you know, look, the Hall of Famer can't do everything. Mm. Every single time. It's like so, catch the ball. Yeah, whatever. Maybe maybe he's losing a little Hall of Fame luster. But, it's starting to uh, look less likely, yeah. <laughs> Ryan Tannehill is doing so many of those things that he couldn't before, uh, which means, look, Tennessee can win these, these shootouts. I mean, I think they've got a, a legit shot here, and, you know, especially against the Texans team, that overall the secondary outside of a few games has been you know, pretty much a disaster. So we have both gone with Tennessee. Yeah, I'm riding the Tannehill train, and I think, you know, he's gonna he's uh he's gonna be tough to stop in the playoff. God, you have actually overhauled me in the picks. I've had such yeah. a stinking run down the stretch that you've actually overtaken me. I'm up two, I think, on you, right? You are, yeah. How many five clear of Austin? That's how bad my run in has been. Austin finishing strong. Well, no, I wouldn't go that far. I think it's more that I'm collapsing down the stretch. Oh, well, that's fair. That's what you do. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, we're both year. taking the Titans here, which means we're expecting no fun playoff scenarios here. Uh, well, yeah, it's certainly that that already nixes the Raiders, right? Um, and and it would the Steelers. So, yes, uh, yeah. So, so yeah, so we're both taking the Titans to grab the last wild card. Yes, but, but if we were wrong, right? Let's talk about the Steelers. <laughs> Here's what the Steelers need. Essentially, they need to win and have Tennessee lose yes, or tie. And that's where you've got the other quirky stuff, right? Pittsburgh could also get in if they tie and the Titans lose. Or if Tennessee loses and the Colts win and the Raiders lose or tie. This is just bad. This is bad podcasting. It really, really, yeah. scenarios. Or if Tennessee loses and God. the Colts win and Pittsburgh ties. They beat Oakland in strength of strength of victory tiebreaker. I think we should, for the sake of sanity, suggest that every scenario that requires a tie is not going to happen. Okay, we'll just forget the tie stuff. Yeah. I mean, this, long story short, Pittsburgh needs to win and Tennessee needs to lose. They need to win a game in which the two starting quarterbacks are Duck and RG3. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Going up against two good defenses. Now, even if the Ravens rest a whole bunch of people, their defense is probably still going to be good, particularly going up against the Duck. And by the way, at this point, I don't think the Steelers have any alternate options. Like, you know, last week it was Duck got himself benched, Rudolph came in, he got hurt, Duck came back. Like, Rudolph still hurt, so it's Duck or nothing, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. And Duck, you know, you know he, he was he – was, okay in some other games made a few big throws he was very bad against the buffalo bills and you know i think he just kind of is what he is but they've won games with him uh with despite his 48.7 pff grade right now yeah uh they've won games without uh, with him playing just meh because the defense could dominate i'm really interested to see rg3 and i know he won't have the entire supporting cast that Lamar Jackson had, but you can't, like, it's the NFL, you can't bench everybody. Like, there's only so many roster spots, so some guys have to play. RG3, running this Baltimore offense, will we see glimpses of, like, what RG3 could have been if he was in this, 
in this nice system beyond just his rookie season. I think that, and, it, and it's going up against a pretty good Pittsburgh defense. I think that'll be one of the interesting storylines because I don't know that Baltimore, it's not just Baltimore rolling over. Like, RG3 is still talented. They still have a lot of talent on offense and a good offensive system. This is a tough game for the Steelers. Yeah, he is talented, and it is intriguing seeing him run this offense in particular because, you know, obviously it's a significant part of what's going on with Lamar Jackson's MVP caliber season. Um, The really interesting thing about it will be who on the offensive line sits down. Um, They've already talked about resting. I think Marshall Yanda is definitely being rested. Like, he's one of the guys that they announced is not going to play. Um, but if they if they rest anybody else in that offensive line, if they go into this game with four of the five offensive linemen still intact, then I think it does become kind of interesting for RG3 because... You know, I, when you've watched him play in the preseason or whatever since, like he's not the same guy physically. He just doesn't look anything sure. like as athletic as he used to. Um, but this is a kind of offense that can paper over some of that and still make him, you know, intriguing. That I'm curious to see how it'll go. Given the Steelers have, you know, one of the best defenses in the NFL, I don't think it'll go well. But it's certainly intriguing to watch. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that they'll use them in the design run game as much as they have with Lamar, but they still can, you know, use they use motion, they use play action, they use all these different ways to create big play opportunities. Got some of those speed guys on the outside to get the ball down the field, the tight ends in the middle of the field. So uh, it's like a data point well, in RG3. The other Maybe thing is – a significant one, but it's one. Yeah, the other thing is that Trace McSorley might see some time, and he's a guy that I think you might genuinely run – the exact same offense in terms of design runs and all that kind of stuff. Like, obviously, McSorley isn't uh, Lamar Jackson in terms of what he can do with the ball in his hands, but you, ha- I think you have less innate fear that he's going to snap himself in half the way you do with RG3 when you send him on a design run. Yeah, and honestly, the talk this whole offseason is going to be about, hey, can our team's going to – it's a copycat league. Our team's going to try to copy what the Ravens did with Lamar Jackson. And it's like, look, they've got a guy with wide receiver type of – after the catch ability, who could also throw the ball accurately. Did I, is that okay? Is that okay to say? Yeah. There's not, too, there's not too many people who could run the ball like Lamar Jackson, and his improvement as a passer has made him essentially the MVP of the league. That's why he's special. I don't think that that has proven that, hey, Jalen Hurts is going to be an, A-lim- an MVP candidate, right? Or that you know somebody's going to trade for Trace McSorley because he's got this skill set that's like Lamar light. I think Lamar is just that unique. But if Trace McSorley gets out there and puts together some pretty good plays and all that stuff, I think it gets the wheels turning even more for teams around the league. Right. Maybe but, a team like the Chargers or whoever, like our teams that have to think outside the box as they look for their next quarterback. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't – you're right. I, what I think it should do, though, is – make the door as wide for spectacular college athletes or college quarterbacks that don't fit into a traditional NFL mold in terms of their projection to the next level, right? So when you get a guy that's doing incredible things at the college level, but it's predicated off a lot of rushing and all this kind of stuff, it's not as easy to dismiss anymore because you go, well, okay, but look, we've got Lamar here who the story was much the same you know he had limitations as a passing quarterback now he's improved that which is why he's an mvp candidate as opposed to just a quality starter um but the whole point is you had a guy who did it differently was hugely based off athleticism and in the past well even this even now was written off to the point where he was drafted 32nd instead of first right now you can look at these guys and say well okay there's a legitimate way that they can succeed and not just succeed but become mvp candidates if the offensive system is good enough yeah i mean it'll definitely open up i think some more opportunities and uh, you know again this will be this will be interesting to see if you know what rg3 and or mcsorley can do here pittsburgh essentially needs i think their you know their best effort defensively we've talked a little bit about all their pass rush Javon Hargrave, one pressure away from 50. Your boy Bud is still two pressures away to be, you know, we don't see that often. Four teams that have guys getting after the quarterback with over 50 pressures apiece. Mika Fitzpatrick, what he's done since coming over on the back end, 87.4 coverage grade this year, making some big plays. So they need all of those guys to, uh, to have their best game, essentially, and then, you know, hope that Tennessee loses and right. got to sneak into the playoffs. And they're, like, I think on their offensive side of the ball they basically need duck a to not make a huge 
costly mistake and B to start giving those receivers a chance to make plays you know whether it's um, Deontay Johnson James Washington Juju's back now they have playmakers that have shown all the way through the season if you give them a shot they can make some plays but you actually need to you know put the ball in the air no that's a good point too you know they they're capable there and I think that's one of the intriguing stories for the Steelers going forward is they've got this they have intriguing young receivers and I feel like they might be one of those hey add add one more big name there or big playmaker there at receiver and they they could be dangerous once again on offense next year especially if Big Ben's returning so um, I like the Steelers because because they're playing for something and I think you know when it comes down to it it is tough it's tough if you're the Ravens are they going to go forward on fourth down are they going to like exhaust every edge that they usually exhaust in a game that really doesn't matter for them I think that's why I like Pittsburgh in this one. Yeah, I think the Steelers' defense will just be too good against backups, essentially, um, even if it's not all of them. I, 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 partic- and the other thing is, I really don't love this offense if RG3 is running it. I actually like it, I think, maybe better if Trace McSorley is running it, but RG3 against the defense is going to be getting a ton of pressure, I think, is a bad story waiting to happen. True. So we're both taking Pittsburgh. Yep. Uh, we don't think they'll get into the playoffs because we both think Tennessee will win. Correct. But um, the other team expecting, you know, praying for a miracle here is the Raiders, right? Yes. So they need the Titans to lose and Pittsburgh to lose, essentially. They also need the Colts to win. And that's what against uh, Jacksonville. Jacksonville. Is that right? Yeah. So they need the Colts to win. So they need – Oakland needs to win and then they need – the Titans to lose, the Steelers to lose. They're two competitors there. And they also need Indy to beat the Jaguars because that would give Oakland the strength of victory tiebreaker. We would be to this, you know, down the road tiebreaker, strength of victory over the Steelers if all that scenario happened. Yeah, because essentially the only way they get in, yeah, the only way they get in is by forcing a multi team tie where the tiebreaker ends up getting, you know, bumped down the list. Right, because they would be. They would be eight and eight. Yeah. And Pittsburgh would be eight and eight. Yeah. And that Titans. Would be, yeah. And the Titans would be eight and eight. They have and the f- Titans would be eight and eight. Yeah. They have to force a three way tie, at which point head to head is irrelevant. You have to go further down the list of tiebreakers. Um, what I think would be the most Raiders thing ever is if all of the things they needed to happen happened and then they lost to Denver. <laughs> they lose to Denver. Which yeah, and is not crazy. Timing wise, again, these, the, all these games are happening at the same time. They're all going to happen at 425. Right. Uh, start times so you can't you know wait and see or know or anything like that it's all happening at the same time that would be that would be incredible if all the other stuff happens and then the Raiders blow it at Denver yeah they won't know until the end but I could easily see that happening those are the three games breaking their way and then the Raiders just incapable of beating the Denver Broncos Drew Locke out duels Derek Carr I, I just I just changed my pick to Oakland <laughs> um, initially I went to Denver but because I've you know, for 15 weeks now, I've been saying Denver, ah, oh, they're a six win team. I have to stick with that, right? They're six to nine. I'm expecting them to sit at six wins because that's what I said that they are. I've but gone, like. I've gone with Denver. I think there's a very real chance that happens. Now, I don't think it matters because I've also gone with Tennessee, but like I can see the Broncos beating them. Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, that's why I said it initially. Denver's always tough to, win, to beat at home, and Drew Locke has been solid outside of that. That's no game. And what I'm interested in here with Locke is, you know, he's not, it's not like he's attacking down the field at an incredible rate as, as far as pure average depth of target or anything like that. But we've seen him give some of those playmakers opportunities to make plays. And we've seen a Denver team where it's like, hey, they don't have a ton of guys to throw to. So all of a sudden you've got guys like, you know, rookie tight end Noah Fant was making big plays for Locke. And Portland Sutton continues to produce and um, just a little bit of life in that Denver passing attack with Locke, at least, you know, pushing the ball down the field a little bit more than, say, Joe Flacco or, or Brandon Allen did. Have you seen the video that came up on social media of the Raiders' new stadium? Yeah, it looks incredible. Right? So I was there in the summer um, in Vegas, and it, like, it was just sort of uh, a skeleton of a stadium at that point. It was already looking pretty cool. Um, now that it's being, like, clad in black, you know, tinted windows or whatever for the desert heat, that thing is going to look pretty badass. Like, it may be 
crazy and you know oakland is kind of getting hosed but that thing is going to look pretty freaking cool when it's all decked out it's all raiders in vegas um it does look, it looks great. It does just look a, incredible. a skip across the strip from mandalay bay we need to find a way of getting a trip financed out there so we can be there maybe we can podcast live from the uh the atrium or whatever they have yeah let's see does anybody want to do a live show with us if we can get a couple hundred people to pay for some tickets for a live show yeah in vegas in vegas let's just let's just throw it out there right now are our listeners ready for the the pff nfl podcast tour like do we have enough in some cities maybe at the super bowl maybe at the combine in indianapolis maybe training camp do we have enough to do some some live shows i'm thinking live show from the beach at mandalay bay then later that evening we go across to the game someone will get us some you know we got to get some skybox tickets or something chris can swing that right um, oh, yeah, definitely. yeah that, that that feels like a good uh, way of spending some company funds we just need a few hundreds or thousands of people to step up right let us know on twitter and say look we're in whether it's the vegas idea or like come to my city (laughs) whatever maybe in cincinnati maybe we start locally we we could definitely start small just to make sure this thing is going to (laughs) work right like before we commit podcast that you know they're doing this live show bit and they're going on you know on tour so to speak and i think we're ready i think we can do it yeah certainly before we commit to the mandalay bay beach party and the raiders stadium you know debut we should probably make sure we can get five people to cincinnati first (laughs) <laughs> we'll start. All right, we'll start small. But uh, hashtag let us know. Uh, before we get to the NFC, any other thoughts? Raiders, Broncos, do you think the Raiders you, – you said you, you like Denver in this one. I do. I, I think Denver isn't actually that bad of a team. Now they've got a quarterback that can at least – you know show up and make some things happen i think they've got talent on both sides of the ball they've got some playmakers the raiders have kind of become what we talked about them being right at the start of the season which is a fairly depressing outlook with just a couple of surprise names like darren waller becoming only the whatever it is 22nd tight end in nfl history to top a thousand yards um like the the discovery of darren waller is basically the story of the raiders season in 2019 which in and of itself speaks volumes i think of the rest of things like he's become a really good player but the fact that that's your that's the thing that would be held up as what this season meant is vaguely depressing yeah they need a little bit more from their actual draft picks and all that stuff i think on denver's side you've got really good performances from justin simmons at safety alexander johnson who again is another just crazy story who emerged as one of the best linebackers this season when you look back at this year for Denver, I think you're going to say, hey, look, we've got we have some intriguing playmakers on the defensive side of the ball, some emerging playmakers on the offensive side, and a quarterback who uh, I don't want to overrate what Drew Locke has done before. He hasn't graded well and even in the games where the stats were good, he hasn't graded all that well, but um, you know, similar to Daniel Jones, has instilled a little bit of uh, confidence and excitement looking forward for them. All right. I'm going to take I'm going to take Oakland in this one. I'm going to take Denver. Um, there's three AFC all AFC team battles that we need to touch on in some way, shape, or form. So let's just go through them rapid fire. Uh, New York Jets at Buffalo Bills. The Bills are better than the Jets. They win the game, right? Yeah, I think so. But the Bills, I don't. They're just playing. They're in the five seed. They're locked in and not playing for much. I wouldn't be surprised to see the Jets win, but they'll take Buffalo here. Buffalo's defense going up against Sam Darnold and that Jets offense will be kind of interesting. Darnold remains pretty impossible to pin down to anything at the moment. Darnold averaged about four and a half yards per attempt against the Bills defense in week one. That's what I'll be looking for. Can he he challenge them down the field just a little bit more? But I'll take Buffalo. Okay. Uh, Continuing the theme of depressing uh, quarterback (laughs) play, Cleveland... Browns against the, the hometown Cincinnati Bengals in the house. We go. We should go down to the stadium and find out exactly what the hell is wrong with Baker Mayfield and the Browns offense. Um, do you think we can pull an interview with him? Let me DM him. You should do that. Me, you should. In fact, you should lead with you know Baker just trying to find out what the hell is wrong <laughs> this season. Any insight? What's wrong? Question mark. Yeah. If he invites us down, we'll, we'll go Sunday morning um, uh, and meet up with him. This is. I mean, the Browns top to finish or top to bottom this season have just been depressing on offense Nick Chubb is great everything else is not um, but they're going up against the Bengals who still have nothing to play for secured the number one overall pick um, 
and did it despite desperately trying to win against Miami for giant periods of that game. Yeah, our Bengals fan friends said, look, the best case scenario is to lose against the Dolphins, which they did, and then beat the, beat the Browns in a game that doesn't matter. Right. So, so they're rooting hard for this. The Bengals fans can finally root for a win and hope that you just ruin all morale in Cleveland. I think the, the story here is, is this the last game for Freddie Kitchens? Do they move on from him? Are they going to bring him back for year two? How do the Browns finish the season? Do they have any sort of momentum, so to speak, going into the offseason? They whether whether or not that matters, kind of like the uh, the Patriots, like the level of depression versus the record they're on seems disproportionate. Like if they beat the Bengals, which honestly they should. I mean, whether they do or not is a different matter. But let's say they beat the Bengals, they finish the season seven and nine. Like given the pantheon of Cleveland disasters in the last twenty years, that's like that's one of their better seasons. I, so I would rather compare it to what the what say what the Vikings have done this year. The hype is higher because so last year the Vikings bring in Kirk Cousins, high expectations, don't make the playoffs, right? But Kirk Cousins is still there in the same, you know, and he's still a top half of the NFL quarterback. And we think that Baker has that potential. And that's why expectations were so high. But going into next year, they'll still have a lot of this talent. If they could pull it all together from a coaching and execution standpoint, you know, you just push the hype into next year, which I think people still will. They'll be, I, they'll be more tentative, but you're still going to look at them on paper this offseason and say, wow, there's a lot of talent there. Right. Some games. And I don't think they're going to fire Freddie Kitchens. Like, I think the Haslam's are talking about long-term game plan and, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff. I think they want to give this thing time. And, I mean, I, in most circumstances, I'd say that's a good idea, but things have been such an unmitigated disaster in terms of the simple things this year that it's it's an interesting time to make that sort of – to finally stick to that game plan? Yeah, I don't know if this year, you know, if they go nine and seven or ten and six next year, I don't think we should be all that surprised. Right. So I, I mean, I'm view it as a stepping a stepping stone toward next year rather than a massive disappointment. It's a whole different perspective, skew and positive for the Browns, who were both taken to win, right? Yes. All right. And the last one is Jags. Yeah, Indianapolis Colts at Jacksonville Jaguars, which has some vague playoff implications to the Raiders and nobody else, I think. Yeah, they need but the Colts to win, we said. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. How does Minshew finish up his story? And, um, you know, the Colts the Colts secondary played really well last week. I thought they were fantastic, whether it was Will Greer induced or not. Yeah, that helped. Mm. But I think that's the big story for the Colts. Um, they've got a lot of young players. They've added a ton through the draft the last couple of years, sifting through which of those guys are a part of their future. Just another another week to, to look into that uh, Minshew has not had a grade above 60 since week 9 since they benched him yeah. in fact um, yeah it's it's funny because if, he, if you reverse his season right that changes the narrative this is what we always say about young quarterbacks it's not always this upward trajectory you think they would start poorly and then get better and Minshew came out and was like is he the next Tom Brady 6th round star and now it's like okay did the deep did the league catch up to him or did he just progress into the reason why he was a sick throw out there. It's interesting that it's literally stuff. it's literally the, the week they benched him that he hasn't. I mean that that at this point represents a fairly hard line in his season of mostly good with some occasional yeah. clanging ugly games to hasn't had a good game since they put him back in the lineup. Yeah, it's not great. Maybe that wasn't a great call. <sighs> Maybe Foles is the guy. I still you know. I, w- I want I want more Nick Foles data points, Sam. That's all I want. I want to, I want to see more Nick Foles for an entire season to figure out what he is. I mean, didn't get it this year. I just I didn't I didn't like the decision in the first place. But they've put themselves in such a horrible box now with the move they made at quarterback, i.e., to bench Nick Foles again. Right. Now I get that he was playing badly enough that at some point. But the way the fact that Minshew wasn't able to spark anything when he came in in relief gave you the cover to put yeah. Nick Falls back out there and they didn't and they tied themselves to Minshew who's basically played like crap since they did that and now they're screwed because neither of these guys thinks they're the guy you know not you can't have confidence in either of them given how they've played so far like now you've gone from having two potential quarterbacks to none I honestly think it was it had less to do with Falls and more to do with this concept of well if we have a first contract QB you're way ahead of the game 
And if that wasn't a thing, I don't think Minshew was outplaying Foles by that much. But I think it was like, man, we might have a first contract quarterback to build around here. Let's see. Let's see if we could ride this out and then he could build elsewhere and all that. I think that was a huge factor. But then in the if, whole if that was it, decision. why did they ever put Foles back in the lineup? <laughs> no, I'm saying the second time that they – like when they benched him after – I think they felt obligated to put Foles back in. And then at the, at the you know first sign of – struggle it was like all right let's let's ride out Minshew and get him some more reps and see if he's got to build around in which case they've made bad decisions at least twice in this sequence well yeah they didn't have a great season it's not good i mean (laughs) then they've screwed it up multiple different ways so we'll spend all we'll spend all off season figuring out what they should do with the quarterback position yeah god i don't know that anybody can know at this point so yeah hopefully for Minshew's sake he's able to have like a nice week 17 game we can at least roll in with a little bit of optimism otherwise their qb situation is just a mess yeah well that's what we're looking for uh how hard could it be jack i could do the job hashtag give me a call hashtag how hard could it be hashtag how hard could it be and like almost all of this division is in the playoff hunt turns out it's harder than you thought it was yeah i mean it's it's not that hard because they're all bad if you had one good team, they would crush everybody else. Like the Jags are five and ten; they're by far the worst team in the division. Everyone else has a shot at a five hundred record. Yeah, because they're all mediocre. Mediocre just division. Okay, how hard could it be? All right, all right. Let's unpack this crazy NFC. I don't even know where to start here. Wait, let me talk about my outstanding shirt. Oh, sure. Uh, Steve's not beside me right now, but I'm sure he is clothed, shod in proper cloth outfits am i correct steve i i was look i'm wearing some work from home attire at the moment but let me just say throughout the christmas holiday i was rocking my proper cloth and i think the family took notice okay they looked they they enjoyed the uh the nice shirts that i was that i was rocking during the christmas holiday well i'm pretty sure we're contractually obligated for you to be wearing them during the podcast so you might have to you might have to make a quick wardrobe change at home. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing it right now. Right. So on camera right now, I am wearing a fine proper cloth shirt. Um, it's So apparently the material is called seersucker, which I didn't know was a thing, but I'm reliably informed that it is. Um, I, I don't actually know how to explain quite what that is, but it's some weird like ruffled stripes in it that, that are pretty cool. I like it. It's uh, nice and light, but most importantly... It is entirely custom made and custom fit. So right down to these little cool uh, sort of, uh, you know, feature elements in the cuff and the collar. Big fan of those. Uh, Proper cloth gets all their stuff from the best fabric producers around the world. Each one of their shirts goes through extensive quality control testing. So you're getting the absolute best quality and craftsmanship. They have so many ways of tweaking and customizing these things that you're even able to, even able to get them to fit a monstrous human being like Steve. Um, it's the best part. It really is. It, fits. it does. It fits you, which is the most incredible thing. And if it fits you, you can get them to fit pretty much anybody. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you need the bullet point version, it fits well, it's easy to customize, and they save all your customization. They it's do. Online. You can save it all Great. in, like, specific styles, specific types, uh, specific fits. All just save it into your profile, and then you go in there, order. You can have a whole shirt or order in, like, 20 seconds. Proper sh- uh, proper cloth shirts are completely custom made for you and start at just $80. So a completely custom fit shirt for just $80. Um, stop wearing shirts that don't fit. Start looking your best with a custom fitted shirt. Go to propercloth.com slash PFF today. Enter the gift code PFF20 and save $20 off your first shirt. Go see why proper cloth is the best custom shirt maker. Remember, that's propercloth.com slash PFF. PFF. All right, now we can talk NFC. Uh oh, we kill Steve. Do you want to start with? Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I still here? No, you're there. Do you want to? Do you want to start with the number one seed shenanigans or the NFC East shenanigans? Cowboys and Eagles trying to stumble in. Uh. Let's start with the NFC East mess because I I don't want to leave that to the end. That'll depress me. All right. So Cowboys and Eagles trying to stumble in. But the, due to last week's win, obviously the Philadelphia Eagles are in full control. All they need to do 
is beat the Daniel Jones-led New York Giants on the road. I think this is going to be more difficult than expected, but the, the Eagles win and they're in at the Giants. Can the Giants play spoiler in this one? Yeah, so much like the Raiders thing, I'm basically week 17 for me is largely rooting for comedy. Um, at this point, I'm kind of done with all the wild card teams or most of them. The ones that were like waiting to fill up the last spots have no shot of doing anything. They kind of suck. So really, I'm just looking for the funniest possible thing to happen in week 17. The funniest thing to happen in the NFC would be the Eagles having really like taken Dallas's soul last week, not because they were particularly good, but because they were that inept and Dallas still couldn't manage to control their own destiny and clinch a playoff spot. For them to take the the take their own destiny in their own hands and then throw it all away by losing to Daniel Jones in week 17 would be freaking hilarious. Um, it would be possibly even funnier if Dallas then lost as well. So basically, I'm just looking for losses across the board in the NFC East. Yeah, and then remember a couple of years ago they had all that craziness like the Bengals had that miracle play to win and it put the Bills into the playoffs and like there was all sorts of stuff going on during the four o'clock hour I think it was just the two you know, in the 2017 season I think we could easily see a lot of that I mean the four o'clock hour in both conferences is going to be just insane because you know these again these games are going on at the same time Cowboys Redskins and Eagles Giants I think the Giants have a legit shot here they've same. I know they gave up a ton of points to the Redskins, but they've got some some improved performances on the back end by some of their young guys in recent weeks. And Daniel Jones is capable of, of making those throws down the field where the Eagles, you know, haven't covered very well. Right. So I think we could see some explosiveness from that Giants offense against the Eagles defense. Yeah, I mean, I think they're going to need to score some points to win this game because I think Daniel Jones and the Giants will, even if they manage to bottle up Saquon Barkley or shut down the Giants' run game, Jones is going to be able to pass against this Eagles secondary because it isn't very good. They've been giving up a ton of points and yards to pretty much everybody they play. So Carson Wentz is going to actually need to make some plays with a receiver group that still doesn't exist. Um, yeah. And Wentz, I told you, a lot of people in Philadelphia are like, there you go, Carson Wentz with a statement game. And Like, look, I know the situation was tough, and he's got no wide receivers. And, you know, you went 30 for 39 or whatever it was. I mean, there was this methodical, solid game from Carson Wentz. But ultimately, they still scored only 17 points. And Dak Prescott's leaving deep balls on the table. Wait. Mm. He's, leaving, he's leaving deep passing opportunities. Cut that out, guys. He's leaving deep passing opportunities on the table uh, in that game that completely changed the narrative if he just hits one or one of his receivers catches one. I mean, it's not like the Eagles figured it out offensively. They've been just, you know, sneaking some games out late, including against the Redskins a few weeks ago. So I think this is going to be a tough game in New York for them. I really do. Yeah, plus they lost Zach Ertz in that game. Like, he broke his rib. He got drilled in the side. Came back in the game with undoubtedly all kinds of painkillers. Um, yeah. Doped up to the eyeballs. They, I, I don't know that he's going to play this week. They He hasn't been practicing, obviously. They signed Richard Rodgers tight end to basically, you know, contingency. But that, like, at this point, they've got nobody left. They really don't. Like, it's Greg Ward is their only receiver, effectively. They've got the running backs out of the backfield. And now they're down to um, Dallas Goddard because Zach Ertz is out, essentially, as well as their tight end. So they've got, like, one wide receiver who was playing in the AAF earlier this year. They've got one tight end who is their, you know, who is one of two that they like to deploy. And then they have running backs out of the backfield. Like, this might be the most depleted receiving core I can ever remember seeing. I, I, I'm changing my pick. To the Giants? I, I also don't want you to catch me. Oh, that's so that's I, not I fair. I have the same picks as you. That's, that's, that's harsh. Uh, I've gone from, I've just talked myself into, I'm taking the Giants over the Eagles. Yeah, well, that's where I started off going. Um yeah, I honestly think, look, the, the the Eagles didn't win the game last week because they were dramatically better than the Cowboys. They won the game because Dallas was just pitiful. Um, I think the Giants are going to cause them some problems, and I don't know that Philadelphia, I don't know that they have the shots to answer anymore. Yeah, I think that's 
Uh, I could see that happening. So I'm, I'm going with the Giants beating the Eagles here. Uh, I'm also kind of like you rooting for a little bit of chaos. Uh, so continuing that chaos, right? <laughs> Much like the Raiders could have the other three games break their way and then lose to Denver. If the Giants do Dallas a favor and beat the Eagles, does Dallas beat Washington? Yeah, I, I, I expect Dallas to win. But if they lose, then they, then they're out. Obviously, they need to win paired with, with an Eagles loss. The Cowboys need a lot now to get into the playoffs, but got to get through Washington first. They do. And they will, right? I mean, well, I don't know. Like, this Dallas thing is a mess right now. Um, like, the only reason they haven't, I think, made wholesale coaching changes already is because they can still make the playoffs. Like, they, the only thing worse than you know getting rid of your coach and admitting the whole season was a disaster in the middle of the season is doing so and then still accidentally backing into the playoffs and not having a coaching staff anymore because you just fired them all they're also they're two weeks removed from just dominating the Rams. you just they, they feel like they're more in line for one of those performances because every time you're ready to write off jason garrett or whoever or the team in general they're like oh by the way we can dominate watch and here they go. I mean, a lot depends on Dak's health and his shoulder. I think that was a big factor last week, sure. But it's also in line with Dallas's roller coaster ride under Jason Garrett. So I can expect, you know, they you know, pop back up and take care of business against Washington. So the key thing for this game is that Dwayne Haskins is out. Um, the injury that he suffered last week, they're not. he's not going to make it back for this game. It's going to be Case Keenum, a quarterback, as opposed to Haskins. Honestly, that... I don't know that that makes him better or worse, but it's just it makes it less interesting. You know, we know what Case Keenum is at this point. We don't know yet what Dwayne Haskins was or is. And the most intriguing thing about Washington's run down the stretch was simply more Dwayne Haskins play on tape. So he looked like he was finally starting to put some things together and actually make some plays in addition to taking care of the football. And now we're not going to see that down or at least the final week of the season. Yeah, we're just the NFC East just got all sorts of crazy the last couple of weeks. Washington and the Giants going into overtime with a shootout, the Cowboys Eagles game. Now they're all, you know, playing each other again this week. I think as bad as the NFC East has been, they're going to create plenty of drama and excitement for us this week. I'll take the Cowboys, but um, I could see Case Keenum, you know, putting together a nice game in Dallas and, and keeping it close. Yep, I have also taken Dallas, which means that both of us are going for the Cowboys back in their way into the playoffs and hosting wow. a playoff game. Chaos. Wow. And honestly, yeah, I don't that's, I don't think that's, it's nuts that's, that's that they would win. Surprising. I don't think it's yeah, nuts that they would win a playoff game if they end up backing their way in and hosting one. Completely agree. And, you know, that's that would I would I'd be rooting for that just because I think it reminds people not to overreact to everything you see every single week. Because who, you know what, the Cowboys will surprise you. Who week. would they get? Would they host the Vikings again? Would we get a rematch of that? They'd be four. Uh, who's the five seed? I think it's Minnesota, right? And who would get six? Uh, I don't know. No, because the Niners are the Niners. Oh, yeah, the the other the non the non NFC West team. So they wouldn't get the Vikings. They'd get the NFC West team, right? It could be a rematch with Seattle or something like that, like they had last year. You could easily see the Cowboys beating Seattle. I think the Niners would be more difficult, but you could easily see them beating Seattle. Yeah. All that said, I'll probably pick Seattle over the Niners. Mm. It's home field. All right, so that's the NFC East mess out of the way. Where are we going now with the rest of it? Okay, let's we'll start with Green Bay, but there's four teams essentially in the mix for two buys. Right. The Packers, the Saints, and then the two NFC West teams, the, the 49ers and the Seahawks. So starting with the Packers, they clinch a first round buy as long as they win. Uh, at Detroit, which I think uh, twelve and three versus three eleven and one. Mm. You know, we should should see a Packers win in this one. Um, so they win a first. They, they get a first round buy as long as they win, or New Orleans loses, um, or some crazy tie stuff. But Green Bay at least controls their own destiny as far as the buy. They could also get the number one seed with a win and a Niners loss, or a Niners plus Saints loss. Ah, that no, just a Niners loss. So they're so essentially, if you're a Packers fan, you're rooting for a win, and then Seattle to win on Sunday Night Football. That's not crazy. Um, this uh, this 
previous Monday night football game was a big sort of statement for the Packers. Um, like, obviously, they've been winning all the way through the season. They've been in the kind of hunt for the number one or for the top seeds throughout the season, if you've, even if they've been a game or so back for most of the year. Um, but I hadn't quite bought into this idea that they were a really good team yet. But against the Vikings on Monday Night Football, they dominated that game from a defensive point of view in a way that would have them winning against pretty much anybody like that defensive front Kenny Clark, Darius Smith in particular absolutely wrecked the Minnesota Vikings offensive line and you know I don't think the Vikings offensive line is is particularly good but to have that kind of performance means that your offense doesn't even need to be it, it barely needs to function for you to be able to win games like that and we know that they can at least be decent across the board the vikings have a really good defense they turn the ball over a ton of times in that game which doesn't happen very often like aaron Rodgers got confused into an interception that virtually never happens um so for them to turn the ball over that many times and still win the game because of their defensive uh, performance i think that was a huge game in terms of them saying we can go and beat any of these teams in the nfc particularly if we host the playoff games yeah i mean is, does, doesn't this feel like it's kind of the narrative around the league it's what we said with new england it's what we said with the chiefs all these teams where it's Brady and Mahomes and now Rodgers, these these quarterbacks, and not that Mahomes, Mahomes is still special and awesome, but Brady's getting a little bit older and Rodgers really has just played okay this year. You've got all these guys that you at one point expected ridiculous high-end performances. Hey, you can go carry the team. But the narrative is now more like, look at this Packers defense. They can go out and win some games for you. Look at you know, New England might have to rely on their defense. Kansas City has crept for, back toward average on defense. A lot of what's happening around the league is some of these high-end quarterbacks uh, having this, uh, you know, good all-around team or, uh, uh, around them. So I think with Green Bay, it has been a little uncomfortable offensively this year through the passing attack. Then you have Aaron Jones breaking out some big runs and before you know it, okay, it's, you know, they scored 23, but they've had a bunch of games where they've, it's been the defense just, you know, shutting down opposing offenses, including Monday night, um, at Minnesota. I'm with you. It was an impressive performance. I think it spoke to also, you know, Minnesota regressing a little bit offensively into, um, you know, closer to what we thought they were. Not that they're that bad, but, you know, they had been at such an efficient level for much of the year. But I'm with you. Huge statement game for Green Bay. And I think anytime you're going to go into Green Bay in the playoffs, you don't know what the weather is going to be like. It's going to be really difficult and you know the advantage again goes to green bay's defense there this is now the third worst grade pff grade of aaron Rodgers' career um so yeah he's i mean not counting small sample size seasons you know where he basically didn't play um right he really hasn't played that well at all this season and yet again if you make the postseason if you're hosting playoff games if the defense is playing that well you kind of expect him to still be a factor that bodes, you know, dramatically in your favor. Like he's going to be a net win based off the special things that he can ha or make happen if and when he needs to. Yeah, and I, so I think it's weird because last year it was a lot of, hey, Aaron Rodgers and Mike McCarthy and who's, who's to blame for the inefficient offense and all that stuff. I think we've, we've realized Rodgers has pretty much been the same guy over the last couple of years and the play calling hasn't really elevated him this year, but the difference has been year two, I think, under Mike Pettin, a lot like this whole Kirk Cousins example that I gave. I was really intrigued by Mike Pettin joining that, uh, that Packers defense and what they were able to do because he could scheme it up, man. He's got a history of, of doing some nice things defensively. Then they add in the Smith brothers, and they, they have this better pass rush and some guys that, you know, improve in the secondary and before you know it Green Bay is really tough defensively under year under Patton in year two and I think that's that's a big part of the story Rodgers has been the same guy despite having two different offensive systems but Patton comes in and year two in his system has been fantastic for, for Green Bay and that's why they're in the mix for the number one seat you remember last year um I was I think it was last year I was saying that uh you know people Eli Manning had reached the age at which quarterbacks used to decline and used to be done. But because of people like Brady and Breeze and Peyton Manning, we now expect those guys to last until they're 40. 
but like right. 36, 35 used to be the age where quarterbacks were done and declining and no longer able to play at the level they once were. Like that was the class of 04 a season ago. Now Eli was the first to go. Maybe Ben Roethlisberger as well, depending on how he comes back, if he comes back at all. Rivers maybe took an, an extra year. Like he seems to have hit that age this year. But the 05 quarterbacks are, you know, they're a year behind. They're the next ones up. So Aaron Rodgers. Like that, right? Right. Aaron Rodgers is now 36 years old. We keep thinking about Aaron Rodgers as this guy in his prime at his peak. I mean, maybe he's hit the age where he's no longer 2011 Aaron Rodgers. Like, he's just not the same guy anymore because he's 36. Yeah, him and Alex Smith in that 2005 class. And obviously, Smith had the freak injury last year. I, the thing I struggle with with the Klein is I want to see it physically because if it's something else, whether it's, you know, for Rodgers, when he struggled over the last couple of years, it's because he doesn't take open throws. He doesn't play within the system, right? For when guys declined when Peyton Manning declined I was like okay the ball's not coming out of his hand the same way with, with Eli a couple of years ago he said alright something's happening here the ball's not coming out something's off compared to what he was until you see the physical decline it's tough for me to wrap my head around it you know but with Rodgers it's like why are you not playing within the system why are you not throwing balls over the middle of the field when you should and why are you taking too many sacks and look he's, had, he's been up and down a little bit with that stuff this year he still has the zip. He's just he's missing a few more throws than he usually does. So maybe there's something there. But I'm not, you know, decline. And decline's not this big cliff thing that everybody likes to talk about, right? It could be slow. And with Rodgers, maybe it's, it's the start of a, a slower decline, if anything. I just think it's interesting that he's hit that age. I, I've never, I've, I don't think I've heard anybody yet talk about his age being a factor in any of this relatively poor play for him. Like he's still got, he's still got a grade of, you know, 10th or 11th in the NFL. So it's not like we're talking crisis here, but I I don't think I've heard anybody yet mention the idea that he's 36 years old. And that used to be a point where quarterbacks were done. So that's a good point. You know, the the Rogers might not ever bounce back to the point where we think he could or used to get to, you know, he might just have hit the age where this is his ceiling and this is still more than good enough to win a Super Bowl if the defense is in place, which based on Monday night, it is. Like, they now have our, uh, they're now fifth in our PFF ELO rankings for, for defense, which we said earlier in the season it was one of the reasons they looked so good to start the year. Then the defense kind of cooled off and wasn't quite as dominant again, and now it's, it's right back where it started with. Yeah, again, I think that's why, yeah, they're in that mix for the number one seed. The team that needs a little bit of help but I think there's a, a very reasonable chance that the Saints do get their first round by. They need to win at Carolina, obviously, a reasonable expectation and probably the expectation. But they're going to need some help. They need either the 49ers or the Packers to lose. And if both the Packers and Niners lose and or some tie situations, then the Niners could have, I mean, sorry, the Saints could have the number one seed. So the Saints could take care of business and still land at number three in the seating or they could take care of business and get some help and land at number one. I think the range of outcomes for the Saints is as crucial or dependent on you know, on other teams as, as any other team in the NFC for, for this week. Yeah, so their game is easy, right? Because the Saints are going to beat the Panthers. The Panthers are starting Will Greer. Will Greer so far looks like a disaster. Um, that should be simple. There's almost no way that they lose that game at which point their games come down to green bay who we also think is going to win or san francisco and that's the one that actually could go either way so let's just assume the saints win they either get a buy or not depending on how san francisco goes against seattle and let's skip right across to that game yeah so i think yeah we expect new orleans and green bay to win and i think both teams are going to be sitting there watching sunday night football Packers fans will be rooting for Seattle. Is that right? So that they get the number one seed? Yeah. Uh, yes. No. Both teams will be rooting for Seattle for different reasons. Both, both teams rooting for Seattle. Correct. Yeah, so both teams rooting for Seattle over San Francisco in that game. Right. Green Bay because it gets them the number one overall. Um, and New Orleans because it gets them the second home field advantage by that gets them to buy. So Seattle could be playing this game. I mean, they need the game either way to win the division. Um, 
Everybody yeah, needs the 49ers game. to lose except the 49ers. Right. Oh, there you go. Well said. Well said. Anything else specific on the Saints game? I'd love to see Will Greer, you know, take some steps forward, home game, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, I think it's going to be tough. He's yeah, I mean, you know, we talked before about how there's almost nothing you can do two weeks that means anything. Um, I've kind of revised that a little bit in my head in that it doesn't mean anything in terms of what his actual outlook should be, but I think it means something in terms of what his outlook actually is because if he stinks again this week, I just don't see him getting another shot in the NFL. I, the, way the, the way the league works, I just don't think he'll be given another opportunity anywhere barring a catastrophic run of injuries. So, I mean, it is a big week for him in terms of showing anything, you know, just even to be on the roster next year or to have any kind of uh, faith from the organization. Yeah, you got to look confident here this week. Right. Um, you know, the Saints, the Saints are a little bit more vulnerable on the road. We keep, we keep saying that despite the fact that they do win plenty of games on the road. They won uh, a tough game against Tennessee last week. Passing attack figured it out after Brees started out a little bit slow. But, you know, I think Jared Cook has been a huge part of that offense. Yeah. In the middle of the field, they've taken, a, they've taken advantage of his, uh, you know, playmaking ability in the middle. And that's taken a little bit of pressure off the great – Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara coming out of the backfield and everything. So, Saints are rolling. They look like they're they're ready. But this week, to me, this week's all about hey, do the Saints does, does, does the NFC go through the dome, or will they potentially have to go to Green Bay or have to go to San Francisco, which will um, you know make things a little bit more difficult for them. The Michael Thomas thing is kind of fascinating as well. Um, he's obviously already broken the record. Um, it's how how high he can push it with this final week of the season. He has now had three straight games with twelve or more targets. Um, he's also had three straight games. One sixty by the end of this. Right? Yeah, he's also had three straight games with eleven or more receptions. Um, like he's at one hundred and forty five catches right now. There's only 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 one other NFL receiver above a hundred. Like, New Hopkins is a 104. So Thomas has 41 more receptions than any other wideout in the NFL. There is, what, three more guys, four, I guess, at that push that could make the 100 barrier by the end of the year. So the maximum number of guys is going to be six that are over 100 receptions, and Thomas could be at, like, 150, 160. Yeah, he caught 10 for 101, which is, you know, a mediocre game against Carolina in the last matchup. But Carolina plays so much zone coverage, too. It's one of those games where you could just see him sitting in the middle of the field wide open for, you know, another another cool 10 to 15. Right, like he's got... But it's like... He's yeah. got 145 receptions, but he only has 172 targets. Like, there was a season not long ago where Calvin Johnson had over 200 targets. Like, Thomas is catching 85% of his passes it's insane the rate he's putting up now okay he's not dealing with the same like average depth of target that calvin johnson was back in the day but like they as much as they are feeding him the ball it's not to the degree you might think right they're just so efficient when they do it yeah right it's either we know he's going to be open or you know we mentioned it's not all high percentage stuff his contested catch rate is is fantastic and uh, that's why i mean that's that's how you get the two years in a row at 84 percent catch percentages yep right you catch the easy stuff and you catch the difficult stuff so yeah keep an eye on thomas and just where he takes that record this week all right so before we go to sunday night football um let me tell you about some financial wellness steve yes please doesn't matter if it's football or financial wellness the right questions will always give you the best chance to win western and southern has partnered with us at pff to give you a chance for an up close and personal look at the x's and o's that'll lead to both financial and football success looking for insight on your financial future need an inside the huddle tip head to westernsouthern.com forward slash ask dat ask dash chris to ask western and southern and pff your most pressing questions you could even win tickets to the big game that's west westernsouthern.com slash ask dash chris c-r-i-s to ask chris some questions and win yourself some tickets good job with the reads man thank you i almost got through it 100 percent clean it's a little stumble in the middle there damn it it's not all easy man it's not, it's not all easy i know I'm, I, might, I might make it look easy sometimes but it's not right but reading reading's actually tough <laughs> reading is difficult tell that to my six-year-old all the time yeah, right. It's not easy. She's been reading since she was like three. 
Yo, know, her reading's a problem. Like she reads things that I don't want her reading, and that's it, that's annoying. Yeah, I think she she really needs her own like reality show, Life of Scout or something yeah. like that. Like I used to just you know text people like you back and forth without worrying that she reads it. Now she can like read yeah, it. She's... So I have to either censor it or just make no. You can't read that. That's a life changer. Yeah, really is. And that's like yeah. quite aside from the fact that she can read instructions to things and like dismantle her own window frame and that kind of thing. Yeah, definitely, definitely need reality show on what what scouts get into these days. Yeah, it's difficult to uh, it's difficult to find many pluses to the fact that she can read. I can think of a bunch of negatives right off the bat, but there aren't actually that many positives. We'll get her like writing some books or something like that. You know, get some get some income for the family. Right. Yeah, set her on an author uh, program already. Yeah, see, that would be the only way to take advantage of things. Okay. All right, Sunday night football. The boss will be there. Seattle Seahawks hosting the San Francisco 49ers. The NFC West is on the line. Yes. As well as so many different things. So if the Niners win, they get the number one seed. That's all they... um, I mean, that's what they really care about is is getting the number one seed. You win, and you're good. They could still get a bye if either of those previous teams lose, right? <laughs> it's it's kind of insane that three different teams can – is three different teams can take the number one or three different teams just can carry into the bye? No, three different teams can take number one, Niners, Saints, or Packers. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. Um, We've been saying for a few years now, we've been just saying how loaded the NFC is and all that stuff. And I think this shows just the fact that there's four teams in the mix for a bye and all these teams feel like, like who, who's going to come out of the NFC. A lot of it's going to depend on who gets that bye, right? Like it's, it's not. Wait, no, four different teams, four different teams can clinch number one overall. Seattle can too. Yeah. Seattle, if Green Bay and New Orleans both lose, Seattle is, Seattle's number one. So four different teams heading into the final weekend can take the number one overall seed in the NFC and home field throughout the playoffs. That's ridiculous. Yeah, so the first three seeds are all completely going to be dependent on these few teams, and then one team will land at number five as far as the seeding goes. Right. That's, so th- that is the, like, that's the argument against... Yeah, that's the argument. The, the argument against the playoffs is not that one of these NFC East teams is going to limp in. It's that one of these teams that is fighting for number one overall is going to be five. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a little weird. Yeah, like you're going to go from, you could have home field throughout the playoffs to based off like a double dunk field goal that bounces in, you're now five. Unlucky. You got to go <laughs> on the road to Dallas. Yeah, sorry. You got to have a road game. Right. That, so to me, is the biggest argument. At least three of those four teams will at least be at home. Yes. And one unlucky team. And one team is going to get screwed. Um, the 49ers, so they control their own destiny as far as the number one seed goes. They, they win. They have it. And the NFC goes through San Francisco. Who would have thunk it before the season, Sam? But that's where we are here. Right. 17, the most improved team in the NFL. And that the Atlanta game is the one that's really coming back to haunt them because their losses this season – it's Seattle, who you know, this is a chance of redemption, revenge. Baltimore, yeah, Baltimore on the road in a horrible rain game where they did as well as anybody at slowing down the unstoppable juggernaut. Um, those two make some sense. And then Atlanta, where the dead whale exploded on you once again and you lost. <laughs> and that, like, that's, that, could cost, that could put them in the number five seed right now. And now they have to go I to Seattle. Land at five. Yeah, they can't go. They go. Either of these teams land at five. Right. right. The loser lands at yes. five. And so it's not a place you want to be. Like going to Seattle is never fun. I know the Niners lost at home to the to the Seahawks. Like I, th- I think it's going to be a good tight battle. And the Seahawks are not unstoppable at home like they were for that um, couple year period or whatever. But they're a different team in Seattle. The crowd's going to be nuts and. Yeah, man, this is just going to be a good one. It's just going to be a good game. I think Russell Wilson has regressed statistically over the last few years. He's still making some incredible throws, taking too many sacks. Um, I think a lot of things have just kind of caught up to that offense a little bit. But, man, he is still capable of making those special downfield throws. 
it's just a little bit more defense uh, difficult against that 49ers defense. So the bad news for the 49ers is unlike the first, so they lost the first game 24-27. Now they have to go on the road to Seattle, so it's even harder. The good news is that Seattle lost a whole ton of people to injury. So they lost all their running backs um, in like the last two weeks to the point where, so everyone's talking about them re-signing Beast Mode. You see they also brought back Robert Turbin? <laughs> they basically just re-signed the 2017 or 2016 Seattle backfield. Yeah. Tur- like Turbin hasn't played since like 2017 turn back the clock he might be an even more absurd signing than dragging beast mode off the couch like what the hell is turpin doing being signed nobody else nobody else to call except the guys that they knew from well presumably thomas rawls didn't answer the phone or he'd have been there as well get chris warren out there like it's insane so you got beast mode and robert turpin reforming the backfield dwayne brown is down so their their left tackle is down as well like they have been dealt a pretty significant body blow over the last week or two in terms of injuries yeah i think dwayne brown we 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 joke and mention that running backs don't matter all the time but I do think that the Dwayne Brown is the running backs do matter if Marshawn Lynch is like 280 pounds and can't move. I mean, I don't know what kind of shape he really is, but the Dwayne Brown thing is significant. Even though the, the Seahawks have not blocked well this year, there have been points where since they got Dwayne Brown, they've, they have crept back toward average as, as a pass blocking unit. And he's been uh, a key part of that. Yes. They've been bad this year, even with him, but he's still their best pass blocker at, probably the most important position at least tackle is more important than uh the interior so uh the downgrade there is just massive brown's only given up 17 pressures all year in 12 games i mean that he was he was by far their best offensive lineman when it comes to pass pro so kind of an issue yeah i mean it's i think it's less about the impact that um Dwayne Brown can have individually and more about the guy that's behind him on the depth chart coming in you know we we talked before about offensive line being more a product of how bad your weakest link is that's creating a massive weak link on that left side for the uh, the Seahawks so you know I think this 49 yeah this 49ers even though he's intriguing this 49ers defense should be able to do a really good job I think against Seattle's offense um It'll be intriguing to see what Beast Mode has in the tank, having just dragged himself off the couch or whatever he was doing over the last couple of weeks. Like the last time anybody saw him, he was serving shots at a tailgate for the Raiders' final home game. Um, so that'll be fun. Um, I think the 49ers defense will do a good job, and then it's just a case of what they can get to going on offense against Seattle on the road when there's a lot at stake, and you know that stadium's going to be noisy. Like that, I think, is the key, that side of the ball, to this game. Yeah, so the, the two things I'll be looking for here, do the do the Seahawks revert to this, uh, what the Rams have been doing offensively, boot, screen, boot, screen, what they did to the Niners last week, which we said worked, right? So the screen game to slow down the pass rush and the boot game to kind of slow down the pass rush because the Niners still, they have their edges, their ed- edge defenders playing the run and you know getting down the line backside. And even though I would be attacking that bootleg, so you might be able to manufacture some points and work, you know, essentially avoid those straight dropback situations against a really good Niners pass rush with your bad offensive line. So does Seattle really scheme it up well? I think, you know, Brian Schottenheimer has, has to call a really good game here and not just a run, run, pass, run, run, pass. Old school Schottenheimer game. It's got to be misdirection. And, you know, they've shown flashes of that at times this year, even though it's not his thing. And then on the other side, I really think it's just mistake-free football from Jimmy G. How how generic is that assessment? Yeah, it's nice. Like, like, like they're going to scheme it up pretty well. They'll create some open throws. Just don't make the disastrous decision, and I think the Niners will be okay in this one. Yeah, I mean, they, they now have a lot of offensive weapons that are individually hard to match up with as opposed to it just being the scheme the way it was earlier in the year. So I'm going – I'm going Niners now. I'm switching that. You son of a... You just changed all your picks so they're the same as mine. This is the right way to do it, is to analyze the games. Go back and forth on what you think is going to happen and then make a decision based off of that. You literally have seconds. changed your picks so that you can't lose in the final week. No, I have changed my picks based off what I think is going to happen uh-huh. now that we've, we've put some serious thought into it. And just so happens to have manifested itself in a way where you can lose. Yeah, as long as I pick the same teams as you, I'll be safe. That means I need to go back in there and change two. 
Yeah. Damn it. Well, you're not just trying to beat me. You're trying to beat Nathan. So you have to. I don't do think that can off. happen anymore. You need him to go like Owen 16. Yeah. Don't worry, though. He's finally seen the injury report, so he'll be file- filling in his picks any minute now. Oh, I see him. I see him in the document right now. <laughs> All right. So we're both going with the 49ers, despite one of us being with Seattle like two minutes ago. Yeah, I think the look the home the home thing always always gets me. I just I love the way. Other than you mentioned, other than the Falcons game, I just love the way the Niners have stepped up and handled adversity. You know, wins in New Orleans in a shootout situation. They've had dominant defensive performances. They found a way to win different ways. You know, multiple ways. And I think the NFC has had a team like this over the last couple of years, right? And it's been a it was the Eagles in 2017 kind of broke out, had their big year. The Rams last year broke out, had their had their big season. And this is the Niners this year. You know, teams that you're like, are they real? Can they do it in this situation? Can they do it in that situation? The Niners, other than a Falcons, you know, dud, have have done it in every situation. And they've impressed. So I think they do it again. All right. So there are three relatively inconsequential NFC games left to talk about. Let's fire them through and then let's get you to Disney on ice because oh, I can't wait. apparently that's, that's a thing. Um, they're going to love it. I'm sure they will. Uh, Atlanta Falcons against Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I mean, the only thing to watch here is 30 for 30 watch, right? 30 is what? 30 club. Oh, Jameis. Does Jameis get the 30 interceptions and does Eric Eager win his prop bet <laughs> most passing yards? in the NFL this year for Jameis Winston. How many consecutive pick six does Jameis open this game with? It's just amazing. Like, there's so much pressure. Think about how much pressure there is in the opposing defense. Like, hey, look, we it's going to give us a pick six. Like, we got to take advantage here. Do, like, if you're, if you're facing Jameis during the week, do you spend extra time running, like, DB catch drills during the week? <laughs> you know, like, most of the time yeah. we're just working on coverage. But this week we're going to make sure you guys are catching the ball. You're going to have six to seven opportunities. we got to you got to catch at least four. Right. right. You've got to actually have some hands this week. It's important. Jameis does have a commanding lead in passing yards, 4,908. Wow. Dak, uh, who's about, who is at about 4,600. What's 4, the, uh, what's the record now? The, oh, it's like 5,500. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I think that's where Peyton landed in 2013 or something, wasn't it? All right. I'm going with the Bucks. You're going with yeah, the Falcons. 50, this is the only game we differ. Yeah, there we go. I'm not going to change it. Good. I'm not changing it. Um, so Jameis watch in this one, and Atlanta's going to finish strong, and you're going to be like, it's going to be another what could have been. All right. Moment. Fair enough. Um, Arizona Cardinals at the Los Angeles Rams. Um, we've got Kyla Murray pushing that sack, <laughs> sack responsible for quarterback record. Yeah. Into, into like far distance out of sight from anybody else we've ever seen it's kind of amazing what's he at right now like we'll check it out i'm taking we're both taking the rams in this one just taking the taking the better team in the inconsequential game he's at 22 right now which is a five more than anybody else we've ever seen but what's kind of interesting is that the guy that's now at five more we've, than we've ever seen is trubisky who hadn't like missed some time this season yeah and those I mean, 22 is more sacks than some quarterbacks have taken overall in the year. Again, these are the sacks we're just completely putting on the quarterback, not even partially. Yeah, before this year, nobody had ever topped 15. And now this year, Trubisky's at 17 and Kyle Murray's at 22. Yuck. Not good. Uh, both taking the Rams in this one. The Rams still have an intriguing offseason with, with so few draft picks in their future. I mentioned last week, they got a lot of... Uh, just got to be really good, really sharp on the personnel side to, to, to keep up in this incredible NFC. Yeah, last... Honestly, can you, can you even look at the Rams season and say they're a major disappointment or you just the NFC is such a buzzsaw it's so difficult to be good every single week you could be the same team and just kind of regress a little bit. Well, I think last week was kind of interesting for them because that was the first time for a long time that they looked like them all, like their old selves. You know, it was schemed up well. Guys were busting open. That looked like the old Rams. Now, it wasn't as good because some of the personnel isn't as good. But yeah. I think that was a good sort of performance for them to have to at least say, okay, this is still there somewhere. Um, it would be nice for them 
if they could back that up this week against the Cardinals and go into the offseason with some uh, positivity, but that'll be the in- intriguing thing to watch. Last game. Kyler is finished strong. Yeah, last game to touch on Chicago Bears at the Minnesota Vikings. Vikings having just been wrecked on offense on Monday Night Football. Now need to bounce back and show that they're not just whipping boys going into the playoffs. So they're locked into number six, yes? Yeah. They're the, the number six seed. They'll be watching all the other games to figure out who's number three, where are they going? Are they going to New Orleans or um, Green Bay or wherever it would potentially be? Yep. Um, but yeah, they, are they going to rest everybody this week as well? I mean, they should because they've got literally nothing to play for. Yeah. I'm taking Minnesota. Is this another one I need to change? Because <laughs> they're going to be resting people. I haven't heard that they're resting anybody. I don't know that resting people is a Mike Zimmer kind of thing. Probably not. Um, but, yeah, so they're just getting ready to go on the road for the next week. Um, I think, you know, even though the, we know that the Bears aren't making the playoffs, obviously, and they um, – I don't know. Was, As of a they, day they, ago – the Mike Zimmer had said he hadn't decided whether to rest starters for Week 17. Ironically, it looks like the Bears are more primed to rest people than the Vikings in this game. Interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not inclined to uh, make my pick yet until I know. Now, I, so the Bears could finish seven and nine, right, or eight and eight, and that's where we are right now. It's kind of what we expected going into the season. Hey, they weren't as good as we thought last year. They should regress a couple different ways, and they have. And you know, they've got some decisions to make this offseason as well. This is... Quarterback position and how they rebuild it. I can't remember who tweeted this, but somebody was saying, I think it was in, re- in reference to the Bears and Matt Nagy potentially resting starters, that it, I'm surprised it's taken this long, but I think we've reached the point now where people are legitimately going to start resting, particularly their starting quarterback in Week 17 if they've got nothing left to play for. Because what's the point? Like, why would you risk injury for a guy who... Yeah, he could miss time. Well, yeah, I mean, whatever at this year, but you need him for 2020. So let's not... Like, there's no point in risking him for a Week 17 game that means nothing. That means Chase Daniel might have to earn his money. Well, I mean, it's Trubisky, so it's not like it's a risk anyway. Like, you know, who cares? I mean, if you're the Bears, I think you just want Trubisky on a high note so maybe you could trade him or something. Well, I mean, I just think, you know, whatever. If you had a viable top 10 quarterback and you'd had a bad season, sure, don't risk him for week 17. But you have Trubisky. Like Matt Ryan shouldn't be out there. Right, but you have Mitchell Trubisky, so you should probably play him. Yeah, a lot of a lot of decisions to be made, I think, in Chicago. I think a lot of people also think, hey, just roll with Trubisky and Nagy and just go for next year. So we shall see. I'm taking Minnesota. Same. I don't know anything about anybody being arrested. Well, I'm thinking Minnesota because I actually comically think there's less chance of the Vikings resting than the Bears, which is true. bizarre. Um, Playing those odds. So, that's week 17. There it is. Week 17, man. Now, next week, we get to be, uh, when we preview, it'll be like, here's four games. So let's, let's deep dive into these four games. Oh, great wow. How, uh, how long do you think we can stretch four games for? Well, we'll definitely get three hours out of that. Yeah, well, well f- four games, oh, four hours. Hour per game. Yeah, hour per game. four games, four hours. Let's just let's look, run this thing as long as we can. Every time I say, let's be a little bit more efficient on the pod, we end up, you know, tacking on an extra 30 minutes. Well, look, you had a hard out at 9.30. It's 9.28, and we're out of here. Well done. I can't say fairer out. than that. Got to go collect the kids at the grandparents. It's just beautiful this morning, by the way. Kids are here. Get the podcast. Go pick them up. Disney on ice. I'm excited. Nice. Make sure you uh, wear a giant advertising hoarding for proper cloth. I will. I'll Propercloth.com slash PFF, PFF20 for $20 off. Yeah, go check it out. Yeah. Well, good work, Sam. Thank you, Steve. Fine work yeah. from your uh, your vacation venue. Some of us are in here working in the office, at the desk, like usual. Yeah, I'm working, too. I'm working on vacation. Huh. And I'll be back. I'll be back sitting right next to you Monday morning as we recap all of the Week 17 crazy. Perfect. I screwed up our uh, my practical joke, which was to have a cut out of you on the board behind me, so I could start drawing all over it during the uh, during the times you were speaking. Yeah, I was hoping that something crazy was going to happen. A little disappointing. It's not it's not my fault. People changed up the background, and now we didn't have the cut out of you like like you were just sitting there. So I had a great plan in place, and people ruined it for me. Oh, I think I muted you again. <laughs> Every time I touch my phone, the connection to you disappears. Great. Anyway. It's time to wrap it up. Yeah, Hard out. definitely out. Gotta go. We're done. Thank you for listening. You guys. Have a great awesome. new year. Thanks. Happy Christmas. All that kind of jazz. Bye-bye.
You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.